I'm here to talk about Jesus. Anyone in the wrong place? I want to think about Jesus today. Psalm chapter 24, verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. It is critically important that you know who this King of glory is. Like there's nothing else important in life if you don't know who this King of glory is. And this is what we want to answer as we're here this week. Who is this King of glory? Not whom do men say he is, but who do you say he is? Amen. We are promised that a glorious King is coming. And the immediate question should be who? Who is this King of glory? Believers are characterized by an eager and earnest desire to know him. He's put his laws in our hearts. He's put that within us. Many know his name, but few really know him. We must really know him. I don't mean know about him. You could spend your life studying and go to school and study all about Jesus and go to hell and be the smartest person in hell. We must know him like Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Amen. Jesus asked his disciples this, whom do men say that I the son of man am? But then he brought it around to them and he said, whom do ye say that I am? Well, Simon Peter, he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. But Jesus said, you didn't figure this out yourself. The father revealed this to you. And so if we're going to know who Jesus is, it must be revealed by the father. So we come to him this morning. We ask the father to open our understanding so that we can know who Jesus is. Not some false view, not some false Christ, but the true Christ. Who is he? And I'll note that now is the time to ask. Because when Jesus comes in his glory, if you don't know him, you will be destroyed. Well, the scripture says that Jesus is a king. Aren't you glad to know we serve a king? Let's just establish this. The prophets declared that a king was coming. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Genesis 49.10 There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Numbers 24.17 Psalm chapter 2 and verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Psalm chapter 45, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Psalm chapter 72, Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Can you say amen? amen. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Amen. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, Isaiah 32. Isaiah 33, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. Amen. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Isaiah chapter 55, Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Amen. 
Daniel had something to say about this. He said, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation. That was Zechariah 9.9. 9. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Amen. So Pilate said to Jesus, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. The rulers of this world, they denied the Holy One and just. And it says that they killed the Prince of Life. And he is also called a prince and a savior, exalted at the right hand of God. Amen. This is our king. This, the prophets also said that this king would be the son of David. The first words in the New Testament say, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is important. The seed was coming from the woman through Abraham, through David to the Messiah, who would come as king, son of David. 2 Samuel 7, 16, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever, speaking to David. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Psalm 89, his seed shall endure forever in his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established as ever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Now here's when the Lord has sworn unto David. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. And as Isaiah said, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. And it, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Amen. And I will set up one shepherd over them and he shall feed them even my servant David. He shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. And I the Lord will be their God and my servant David a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Amen. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given them unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, and they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant shall be their prince forever. Amen. So, you can't be unclear about this. The scriptures describe the Messiah as the King, the Son of David. Amen. To Abraham, God said, I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. But in Samuel's day, there was no king over Israel. God was their king. But the people wanted a king they could see. So God sent forth his son into the world. 
he came, the express image of God's person, the image of the invisible God. He that's seen me has seen the Father, he said to Philip, and Thomas just said, my Lord and my God. The significance of David's kingdom. Nathan the prophet went to tell David. David was sitting in his house after the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies. And he, he said, I want to build a house for God. Well, Nathan was sent to David and he said, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my flock Israel, feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me in house of cedar? So God said, I didn't command this. David's reign typifies a new type of relation to God. It was a relationship based on love, initiative, and heartfelt response to seeing God's greatness. And God points out to us here that David's desire to do something for him was not in response to a command. Amen. You want to do something for God, and God was saying, I didn't command this. You're wanting to do something from your own heart. This is the new covenant. When did I command this? This ought to be a lesson for those who find a command in what God has not said. You know, you could set up a denomination, the anti-house building denomination. God didn't tell him to build a house, but David wanted to because it was in his heart. He loved God and he wanted to do something for God. And this is why he was a man after God's own heart. So Nathan went on and said to him, When thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. So God said, your son, I'm taking him for myself. Amen. And then he said, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So just as Abraham had the promise that from his bowels would come the heir through whom the world would be blessed. Now David is promised a son to reign as king. And this is to be no ordinary kingdom. This is a kingdom based on a new covenant. One of response to God out of love. And this son of David was going to build a temple for God. Praise God. And I'm looking at it right now. So Jesus, I want to establish that Jesus is the son of David. All the people when he was on earth, they were amazed and they said, Is not this the son of David? You know, many of the people that believed on him said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Jesus thoroughly established himself as the Messiah. There could be no doubt. Let's think about it. Okay, what else? If, if he's not the Messiah, what else would the Messiah do if he came? Let's see, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He calmed the sea. He had power over nature. And he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What more would the Messiah do if he were to come? Jesus is the son of David. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, the multitudes went before him, and they cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? 
Who is this King of glory? He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, the Root and offspring of David. And this kingdom that he was to establish is an eternal kingdom. So it's not like any of the kingdoms of this world. In fact, it toppled all the kingdoms of this world. The king of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. As Daniel made clear, it was going to be an everlasting kingdom. The angel to Mary said that the son that she was to bear would be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. No end. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Praise God. But I want you to see that this king, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is a man of war. This king is a man of war. This king is no wimp. He's coming with fire from the throne of God. And he is going to fight to establish his kingdom. He is a mighty king. It's like when, jo when uh, Joshua was going to battle, he was preparing to go to Jericho, and the, uh, the uh, captain of the Lord's ca host came to him. He saw this man before him with a sword drawn. And uh, so Joshua came up to him and said, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he said, Nay. He said, I'm captain of the Lord's host. I'm taking over. Amen. I'm not for you. I'm not for your adversaries. You're for me. Amen. Get behind me. We're going to battle. And he had this sword drawn. Don't think that you can make Lord come and be for you. Amen. He's not going to come get behind you and fight your battles. God's fighting his battles. Amen. And this, this mighty king is a coming king. He's coming. We see him coming. And we shout out, lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. He is coming into the world. The first coming, Jesus, God sent his son into the world. Not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now listen, the world through sin, existed in hopeless separation from God. A whole world of people at enmity with their creator. God's righteous judgment against sin hanging over every soul, and none could by any means redeem his brother. But oh, in the fullness of time, when all things were prepared and ready, for God to send his son into the world, the call rang out. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. The everlasting doors swung open, and the eternal word with God and as God came from eternity and into his creation. He landed in Nazareth of Galilee and was carried by his mother to Bethlehem where he was born a helpless child. And yet he was Emmanuel, God with us. The king of glory had come to his creation, a king they could see. This coming was not with outward glory and strength, he humbled himself, he took upon him the form of a servant, even the form of sinful flesh. He had no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. He came a man. His glory was associated with grace and truth. 
we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It wasn't outward power and force. It was grace and truth. Jesus came to Jerusalem, as, you, as we've read, the, the shouting and rejoicing when he came to Jerusalem. Thy king cometh to thee. He came to his temple. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Since its construction, the earthly temple had been the habitation of the invisible God. This same temple would suddenly find the Lord himself arrive, manifest in the flesh. Oh, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. But who can abide the day of his coming? I'll tell you, the money changers could not. And he will not be patient with hypocrisy in us either. When he comes to his temple, he'll cast out the money changers. Praise God. Amen. But Jesus is also, he's come to the world and he's come to our hearts. I want you to see this, brethren. Behold, the king shall reign in righteousness. Isaiah 32, 1. In order for a king to reign, he must put down all enemies. And Jesus comes to our hearts. You know that one by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And by one man's offense death reigned by one. And by sin hath reigned unto death. So when men fell by transgression sin and death became his king. They reigned over us. It ruled ruthlessly over the sons of Adam. The wages of sin is death. And so it is appointed once to man, unto ever, to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. This is the only king that has reigned unchallenged from the beginning of the world. Amen. Sin and death was our king. Well, the mob came to take Jesus. You know, they had sent for Jesus before. The temple guard went to take Jesus. They came back empty. Do you know what happened? He slew them with the sword of his mouth. Never man spake as this man. Another time they went to take him and he just walked through them. He just walked through the crowd. His time had not yet come, but now the mob surrounded him, and Peter lifted up that sword, cut off the servant's ear, said, the kingdom is here, come on, let's take it. Let's take the kingdom by force, it's time for Jesus to be our king. And Jesus said, put away thy sword. Outwardly, it appeared as if Jesus was abused and killed by the will of men. Earthly rulers and kings rose up to inflict their will upon this helpless one. Jesus, as a sheep before her shears is dumb, did not seem to be the warlike king spoken by the prophets. Look at him. In desolate Golgotha, now away from the cheering crowds, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, hanging on the cross and mocked by those who passed by. Is this the Son of David? But the outward view did not reveal the fierce conflict raging in heavenly places. The Father laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he bore it. 
He bore our sin out from the presence of God. Our king was spoiling principalities and powers. He was blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in the cross. And he made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. No man took his life from him. He said, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up. No man takes my life from me. Jesus, man didn't even do this part of salvation. God did it all. He laid down his life for us. Amen. And at the conclusion of this battle in the spiritual realm, sin was put away and the accuser of the brethren was cast down, having no more basis for accusation. And there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Everything that, think about it, brethren, everything that was against you has been cast down. Amen. We stand clean before our Father, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Oh, this is a mighty king. Oh, he was conquering foes. And he did it with his sword in his sheath. In the cross, the greatest victory, and I say this without qualification, the greatest victory was won in yielding, suffering, and dying. And this is how sin is conquered in us also. We yield to him. We are dead with Christ. We die to sin. And we suffer with him that we may reign with him. Praise God. His strength is made perfect in weakness. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens and come down. We have such joyful anticipation for that day. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Amen. And God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Amen. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. Praise God. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Jesus Christ is the king of glory.